I, I sometimes get the impression, yeah, I thought you'd like that one. <laughs> I, I sometimes get the impression I'm invited to conferences on the same basis that Roman empires invited gladiators to a stadium. They like a bit of blood at the end, all right? Um, I want to be clear, and I was once introduced as um, somebody's favorite cuddly curmudgeon, and I'm still trying to work out what that means, all right? There are probably implications. Um, I'm actually not going to attack anybody, but I'm going to say a lot of things are right in context and wrong in different contexts. Uh, one of the big things which has come out of complexity thinking, which I will explain, is the realization that there aren't context-free methods. Most things are context-specific yeah, in terms of the way we work. And the danger is we try and create universal methods, universal recipes, universal tools, and it won't work. Um, there's also a strong tendency for the past two 20 or 30 years to actually focus on individual change rather than system change. Now I'm going to go into this in more detail later, but that slide, which I tend to change around a bit for each conference, kind of like makes the point. Yeah, yeah, well, I've just come back from the Annapurna Sanctuary Walk. I'm planning to do the five passes around Everest next year. Um, you can have, be very motivated. You can be well-led. I was very happy when I was doing it, but if you actually don't have a sort of sense of fear and dread and if you don't have the right systems in place, it doesn't matter how motivated you are, nothing will change. Or rather, nothing will change in terms of death, destruction, mayhem, and so on. Yeah? Um, so what I want to do is, really this is in two parts, I want to introduce some of the new insights from science. I have two manifestations. One is as Chief Scientific Officer of Cognitive Edge. The other is as Director of the Kenevin Center at Bangor University in North Wales, something we've now set up to focus on the government, NGO, and academic sector. And the mission of the Kenevin Center is to apply natural science to social systems. Yeah? And one of the things we're arguing against there is the empirical approach which dominates social science and dominates methods within the IT industry, um, otherwise known as a case-based approach. Yeah? So the assumption is you go and study things which have happened. From that, you derive a hypothesis. If you are a real scientist, you then go and test the hypothesis. But social scientists don't do that. Having derived the hypothesis, they write a paper. Yeah? Um, if they're management consultants, they start with a hypothesis and find examples to validate it and ignore all the others. <laughs> if you want some weird examples of that, look at Lean Startup and, a whole bunch, and anything by Malcolm Gladwell. Right? Um, all of those are highly selective in terms of what they do. So let's look at some of the issues about case-based approaches. And there are three known effects which are dangerous. One is called the Cobra effect. Uh, this is from the English in India. Uh, you need to understand I'm Welsh, it's the rugby season, so when I say English and when I say British, it has major significance, all right? Um, this is from the English in India. They decided there were too many cobras, something which, having had three close encounters, I agree with. Um, so they created a reward of one rupee for every cobra head which was brought into the district commissioner. And that worked quite well for three or four months until people realized just how much money there was to be had in breeding cobras. And then the English commissioner realized this was going on, so he basically canceled the reward, at which point all the cobras from the cobra farms were released into the wild <laughs> because there was no longer any money and there were too many cobras. Yeah? Um, you see this phenomenon a lot when people announce an initiative or there's something which is fashionable. So behavioral economics, which I really am going to establish later on, um, is highly topical at the moment. All right? So everybody is now defining their actual projects in those terms. In fact, there's a whole skill, if you want to get government money, in working out what the dominant language is and repositioning what you want to do to match that language, regardless of the consequence. And the same actually happens in industry, and that's a, a variation on a cobra effect. Uh, the other one is the famous cliche, uh, the butterfly effect. Um, this is also chaos and complexity theory. Uh, the idea is a butterfly flaps its wings in the Amazonian rainforest and it causes a hurricane in Texas. Now, this is not true. I know Texans. If butterflies were causing hurricanes in Texas, by now they'd have been subject to vigilante action with extreme prejudice <laughs> involving defoliants. Right? Um, the point is, something very small, uniquely in this case, combines with other very small things which produces a major impact. It doesn't mean the same thing will happen the same way twice. And actually, if I look at techniques, let's take um, one of the classic pyramid selling schemes with an IT, SAFE. Um, basically, it's basically predicated on one or two cases with gifted individuals making things work the first time and then publishing a book and a method on it. That's an example of a butterfly effect. Yeah? And again, there's far too much of that around right, in terms of the way things work. Yeah? You, if you want to be scientific, you've got to have people replicate your approaches. It's not just a one-time fit. And the other one is the Hawthorne effect. This is from famous studies. Um, 
Basically, they, tr they played around in the 1920s with lighting levels in Hawthorne up in the United States. There's a big IBM lab there. So they increased lighting levels, people became more productive. So that sounds like we've got a correlation now, doesn't it? Uh, so being good scientists, they decreased the, the lighting levels and people became more productive, right? <laughs> that wasn't meant to happen. And kind of like to summarize a long set of research which has gone on since, if you do something novel, it generally works the first two or three times. Um, so the minute you run a pilot project, if the pilot project works, you shouldn't assume that it's going to work the next time because it's novelty, you put effort into, you put time into it, it's not going to repeat. Yeah? Now all three of those undermine a huge amount of work done in industry and government alike. But then you get the massive one, the confusion of correlation with causation. Uh, this is a, a, is a disease within social science. Right? Um, we say that actually they suffer from physics envy, which is a deliberate play on words. All right? but I'm kind of um, so for example, if Britain wants to increase the number of Nobel Prizes, what we should do is increase chocolate consumption. Uh, but there's a direct correlation between the number of Nobel Prizes and chocolate consumption per nation. Yeah, so to assume that is somehow or other causal connection, you might find it an attractive thing, you know, stuff your kids with chocolate, they'll become Nobel Prize winners. Yeah, there's lots of websites where you can see false correlations, and it's dangerous. Uh, one of the examples of this is Good to Great. Everybody read Good to Great? Okay, it's one of the classics of management literature. Harvard professor goes and studies a whole group of companies who've been very successful for a long period of time. Yeah? Um, he then identifies all the things that they do in common, um, and then from that he derives a set of hypotheses. This is the correlation. He does the mathematics properly. It's very well disciplined. He creates a series of recipes. He's a Harvard professor, so you get things like the hedgehog principle. You know, this is good marketing. Yeah, so you've got a best-selling book, a consultancy method, an approach, and the idea is this is the recipe, follow this recipe, you will be successful like those companies. Now, aside from the fact that two-thirds of them have now failed, or are failing, let's kind of like ignore that because it's a bit embarrassing recently, he, he's now about to write a book as to why they actually failed, which I think is pushing it a bit. Right? <laughs> <coughs> the basic fact is you have any knowledge whatsoever of evolutionary biology, uh, then you look at it and you say, actually, what you've got is a dominant predator. Um, this is a picture I actually took um, in South Africa recently. I have a very tedious project uh, which involves me having to spend time in um, Kruger National Park on rhino poaching. And the, uh, yeah, that, it's a tedious project, all right? But um, I'm, I'm proud of that picture, right? I waited six hours for that. Um, that's a dominant predator in its own ecology. And what happens is when an ecology is disrupted, the existing dominant predators generally die out because they're over-specialized. Yeah? And what then happens is a new dominant predator emerges, generally the lowest energy cost, most resilient creature, and that then becomes the next dominant predator, and the ecosystem organizes around them regardless. So you look at this book, and as I say, it's a great example, and a great, you know, this correlation causation thing. You look at this book, and you say, actually, what he did is he chose dominant predators, like IBM. IBM was a dominant predator from the 1920s through to the 1980s, um, it did something called repurposing, something I'll term later as acceptation. It took sewing machine card control technology and allowed it to get early entry into computing. Uh, Microsoft operating systems still work, like sewing machine card systems as well. You know, there's, the, there's consequences for this in terms of the way it works. So they do that, they get major advantage, right? It's then a hardware type focus. And then in the 80s, the emphasis moves to software over hardware and they don't see it coming. In fact, they hand over the IP rights to Windows to Bill Gates because they don't think it's relevant. Right? And then software dominates, so now Microsoft is a dominant predator. And you know, if you look at it back in those days, you either, you either fed or you fed off IBM, then you fed or you fed off Microsoft. I'd argue now Apple in that thing has now taken over from Microsoft because Apple realized it wasn't about hardware software, it was about what anthropologists call objects of material desire. I, having just bought my iPhone 7, I can give you an example of that, all right? Yeah, I really want this thing, all right? I, what matters now is something which does a job which looks beautiful. I'm not interested in the software or hardware. The, effectively, the ecosystem has switched. Now, there's a whole body of stuff on this on corporate strategy. If you're in a stable ecosystem, then actually your strategy is to feed the dominant predator. If you're in a destabilizing situation, then you need to rapidly fragment into multiple experimental businesses and see what will come out of that. Google are doing that at the moment with Alphabet. Yeah, they're actually trying to create a new market rather than try and dominate an existing market. So I say there are much simpler explanations if we go to the natural sciences. Uh, the other one is thinking fast, thinking slow. Everybody read that book? 
Yeah, I really wish economists and psychologists would walk across the corridor to their cognitive neuroscience colleagues. We knew about that 10 years before we even started the research. It's called autonomic novelty receptive processing, which is a much better explanation. Yeah, there's actually, this attempt to derive everything by personal observation is actually quite dangerous, and it slows us down. There are things we already know if we go to biology, to physics, to chemistry, to anthropology, which we can then apply. So that's what my center is set up for, right? is to actually take that particular approach. And of course, there are other major problems. I'm getting cases big time. This is um, from a whole series of experiments which have been run many times. If you give a group of um, radiologists, now remember radiologists are highly trained individuals working with limited data sets. I spend a lot of my time in user-centric design. I've done, I've done air traffic management systems. I've done heads-up displays. Yet the amount you're dealing with in that case is huge compared with what a radiologist is dealing with. Yeah, so, you know, highly trained individuals, very restricted information set. If you hide a picture of a gorilla on one of the x-rays you give them, over 80% don't see it, even though their eyes physically scan it, and it's significantly larger. Yeah? We do not see what we do not expect to see. Which is the good news is there's a huge amount out there to be discovered we're not seeing. I'm going to come at the end and talk about the new approach we're doing on understanding user needs, where we're actually deliberately killing off the whole concept of interviews, workshops, and systems analysts because they automatically screen what they see to what they've previously encountered. If you want to know the raw science behind this, the most you scan of what's in front of you is 5% on a good day if you're really focused. If you're Chinese, it goes up to 10%. Uh, there's a difference between object and context focus, dependent on pictorial and non-pictorial languages. And it's not better or worse, there's pluses and minuses. So you scan about 3 or 4% of what's in front of you. And then you match it against stored patterns. The most frequently used patterns get activated first. So what you do is a first fit pattern match with previous experience, not a best fit pattern match. So a radiologist has 30, 40, 30 to 40,000 patterns stored in their brain, their body, their tools. The most frequently used ones get activated first. That's how they make a decision. So if you've got any art based on a partial data scan, now, if you think about this in evolutionary terms, it makes a lot of sense. You know, if you're on the savannas of Africa and something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed, do you want to autistically scan all available data, look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, and having identified lion, look at best practice case studies on lions? Yeah? <laughs> By that time, the only document of any use to you will be the book of Jonah, which is the only example I've found of how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnivore. Right? <laughs> we evolved to make decisions very, very quickly based on a partial data scan. Yeah? Now, that's very important to realize. You announce a change initiative, yet yeah, guess what happens? People scan it through the memories of previous change initiatives, and they only listen to 3 or 4% of what you say. You announce you're building a new computer system. Well, what's generally people's experience of change initiatives and new systems? It's generally negative, isn't it? So you're automatically, by announcing an initiative, dooming it to fail. One of the basic heuristics of change these days is never announce you're going to try and change things because you'll trigger deeply negative patterns and people will filter everything you say through that. Now, there are other reasons I'll come to later. You can't define an endpoint in a human system anyway. It, it, it produces perverse results. <coughs> so hold this one because it's of critical importance. Yeah? You will not exceed, see what you do not expect to see. And the only group of people for whom they are exempt from this are people who are fully autistic. And that's why they can't operate. They're scanning everything and being logical about it. Yeah, and most of us have evolved in a different way. So hold that one, because I'm going to keep coming back to it. Um, the other thing, and sorry, this is kind of like referencing one of the earlier speakers. Um, there's something called a naturalistic fallacy in philosophy. This is David Hume. It's important for ethics. It basically says you can't derive an ought from an is. Just because something is the case, it doesn't mean it ought to be the case. If you want, well, I would say is one of the main examples at the moment is allowing children before puberty to spend their time learning on information transfer through screens, which, by, which actually create, effectively activates autism over any other type of capability, because it's a limited flow. Yeah? We actually know that things like paranome traces are critical to determine trust. There's a whole body of sensory stimulation we get, which can't be replicated in a computer environment, and particularly a training environment. 
And if you don't get certain types of stimulation before you hit puberty, you never get a chance to recover them. Yeah? So the fact that people like playing with iPads when they're two or three doesn't mean that they should play with iPads when they're two or three. Yeah, this concept that because people want to do it, it's right, is actually very dangerous in human um, history. So, and the other problem with this is actually the assumption that there's some sort of progression. So again, I, I'm making the context point here. Um, so I think the second presentation talked about the, 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 the pheasant, sorry, peasant, all right? I, I made that mistake once in the school assembly, and everybody thought I did it deliberately, right? Um, so assistance farming works whatever you're born to. Okay, that's cool. I'll buy that, right? But actually, I've done a lot of my work in indigenous communities. One of the things you know in indigenous communities is their primary identity is the, is the collective. The collective understands gifting mechanisms, so actually, as long as you participate, you're looked after. So there are huge things about actually rural environments and agricultural environments that we've lost in the modern world that we can like need to recover. So don't assume this is necessarily bad, aspects are really good. We then talked about the worker. Um, nice little Marxist um, summary there. Um, you know, labor is a commodity exchange for a living. Well, that's true, but if I go back to where I come from in South Wales, yeah, the loss of dignity through lack of work is a major issue. Yeah, the work that was actually solid in the community, the apprentice models, the joining the pit, which every, your father had joined, your grandfather had joined, becoming part of the same chapel, living through that, knowing if you did a good job, you had a job for life. It wasn't always like that. But basically, the whole apprentice model of learning the security, the centeredness of industry in a community, we've lost a lot of that. Yeah? I'm not trying to say things are right or wrong, it's just they're different. And then we get this one. This one actually did worry me. The concept of the free agent. Well, I'm very sorry, that's going to be about 2% of the population. Uh, when I went to university, 8% of the population went to university. We were an elite. All right, the people who will have room for creative jobs will be an elite, and we actually know from epigenetics and everything else, you know, I'll come back to this a bit later on, but basically culture inherits. So if you're born to middle-class, bright parents with facilities, actually it's a biological impact over one or two generations, which is going to make you more creative. Yeah? The reality is, for most people, the future of being a free agent is basically a zero-hours contract. Yeah? And we've got to start to think about this. The future is actually not looking very good at the moment. Yeah? Um, for a very small number of elite people, it's going to look very good indeed, but we're going to have to build large walls with barbed wire around where we live yeah? if we're going to survive. Yeah? Trump is not an unusual phenomenon. If you go back to the history of humanity, the sort of Trump-Brexit stuff actually recurs quite frequently, and we can see the patterns in history. So I want us to be very careful about that sort of stuff. Yeah? So kind of like the argument here, phrased from the 70s, praxis makes perfect. What we need to do is to take soundly rooted natural science and apply it in practice, and then we modify our practice, but always in conformant with the theory. The theory pr provides a constraint. So the fact that something worked for you two or three times, if it contradicts what we know from cognitive neuroscience, then what you've got is a temporary effect, you haven't got a sustainable one. If what you're doing actually conforms with what we know from science, we've got a chance to scale it. Uh, famously summarized this, if you don't know why something worked, you shouldn't try and replicate what. The fact that you've got some correlation or some link over three or four cases, doesn't. and if you don't know why, it's very dangerous to scale it into a what. And that's why we need a new generation of generalists. And just set up a new master's program, by the way, at Bangor, three-year part-time, where people will do the university's conversion courses, those two- or three-week courses that you do to, you know, if you didn't study at A-level, in physics, chemistry, ecology, philosophy, anthropology, over three years. That's 30% of the mark, and then 70% is applying it to a real-world case. Because I want to create a new generation of people who understand broadly, because a generalist is not the same thing as a collection of specialists is a generalist is somebody who actually knows a little bit about many things and can synthesize and integrate the results. And we, we kind of like going to need them um, because they're able to innovate. So, I've kind of like hit a few things there. Um, I'm really arguing against stuff. And I want to go on to something positive. I want to talk about different types of system. Now, this is something which has kind of like emerged over the last 20 or 30 years. If you want to actually impress the natives when you go home, say you went to an argue, a lecture on multi-ontology sense-making, all right? I mean, ontology is one of those good words, right? But basically, ontology and philosophy means the nature of the system. It doesn't mean what IT people mean, which is a glorified word for taxonomy. 
I think what happened in IT is they realized that taxonomy rhymed with taxidermy and they were actually producing similar things. <laughs> so they stole a word they didn't really understand. Right? So in nature, we have three different types of system. One is an ordered system. An ordered system is one which has very tight constraints. And the constraint concept here is you have container constraints and connector constraints. So you have things which contain. So you know, you're not fussed what happens within the container, but you know the boundary conditions. And then you have connections between things. So two different types of constraint. There's about a day's lecture on that, but I'm doing this quickly. So an ordered system has, a, has rigid containers and rigid linkages between things. So it's highly structured. It's highly predictable. Um, we're very good at these as human beings. The example I always give these days is operating theatres. In operating theatres, people count the number of surgical instruments left at the end of an operation and check it's the same as were there, was there at the start. You know, as I get older, I think this stuff is of increasing importance. Um, I know the figures on the percentage of surgical instruments left in operating theatres before they did this, and it's a scarily high, sorry, left in people's bodies. It's a scarily high figure. The trouble is then people say, oh, checklists are wonderful. Everybody heard that? Aren't checklists fantastic? Yeah, they don't go into the why. In an operating theatre, it's a highly ritualized environment. The process of scrubbing up and washing up means that your identity aligns with your role for a limited period of time, and there's a huge training cost in getting you to that stage. So when the surgeon holds up their hand, the nurse will place the right instrument in it without thinking. Yeah. Checklists work in a ritualized environment where identity aligns with role. They don't work outside that environment because you haven't got the same context. Yeah. So ordered systems have value, but we need to realize their limits. Now, for seven years of my life, I worked for IBM. Um, I was conscripted. I didn't volunteer. Uh, I'm quite proud of the fact that for seven years, I didn't fill out a timesheet. It took a lot of effort at times, but open defiance is something we're trained to in the Celtic nations. All right? <laughs> Um, it's amazing what you can get away with if you just get stubborn, right? Uh, you did need top cover. Um, but anyway, I was allowed to do what the hell I wanted. I think every, they, they bought the company I worked for. I think 90% of the Dutch left within the first three weeks. The British were more polite. They waited around for six months, then they left, all right? Um, so given it was a service company, it was a value. But I stayed, all right, because I got a lot of things to do. But it also taught me about bureaucracy. If you work for IBM, no government bureaucratic system even comes near to what you've had to live with. Right? There was a fundamental heuristic in IBM, don't buck the process. And I remember when they took us over, which was a shock, it took about 36 hours from first contact to sale. I've never lived through anything like it in my life. It's why I've resisted venture capital for the last 12 years, because we invoked our right not to be bought, and then the venture capitalist told us what would happen if we invoked the right, and we realized we didn't have it. Right? So that's informed my practice. Either way, the first thing they did was to charge us for coffee and ban alcohol. Now, this is completely unreasonable. We are a major software development house, all right? The coffee alcohol cycle is an essential part of how we work. <laughs> Nobody should be expected to talk to a user before you have without alcohol. It's completely unreasonable, <laughs> right? Um, and then, actually, you need coffee to sober up to write the code, and then you need alcohol again because users never know, ask, want, want what they give them, even though you can prove they asked for it. I mean, this is just part of the cycle. Either way, we got used to this, so we started to hold meetings in mo pubs with meeting rooms who give us an invoice for food and accommodation and wouldn't mention the alcohol or coffee. So that was easily solved. Uh, then it got more difficult. They banned us from buying food for staff. Now, by this time, we'd realized that you don't deal with bureaucrats by arguing rationally and logically on the basis of client or employee need. That won't work. Uh, the only possible approach you have is called a Socratic technique, if you've done philosophy, in which you ask them questions, refuse to give answers, in the hope to catch them in a contradiction, which they will realize then they may reform. It has a 10% success rate. <laughs> but arguing logically has a 0% success rate, so it's a better option. So we basically said, OK, so you know, fine, this is a brilliant idea. We would never have thought of you know, banning food from staff. It's going to save us money. Now, I'm a C-level executive, all right? I mean, this is, I'm not allowed to buy pizza and Coke. Um, so we, you know, you know, we, we want to be nice about this. You know, this is a great idea. We wouldn't have thought of it. This is part of the major benefit of being part of IBM. And we suddenly realized they don't understand irony. So it becomes a deadly weapon that can be switched on and off with HTML code in parallel chat lines thereafter. <laughs> We said, what happens if the only thing, I've got a team, I've got to keep them awake at night, 
um, because I've got to have a system live at 9 a.m., otherwise there'll be penalty clauses, and the only thing I can do as a general manager is buy them pizza and Coke. And then you stay silent. And they looked a bit disturbed, and I suddenly realized it could have been misinterpreted. I said, we do mean the drink. I just want to be clear. <laughs> and they relaxed, right? So that was good news. And so they said, oh, what do you think you should do? And we said, well, we don't know. I mean, this is a brilliant concept. We haven't put the time and effort you've put into this proposal, so we assume you thought of it. Then you realize that sarcasm is something they don't understand either. <laughs> so that becomes a weapon of last resort, right? Um, and they said, okay, you know, vice presidential approval 48 hours in advance. At this point, you move beyond sarcasm into a sort of meta level of sarcasm, right? And you say, okay, that's really brilliant. We would never have thought of that. What happens on the extremely rare occasions where we don't get 48 hours notice of a crisis? And at that point, they said yes in a way which means no. Bureaucrats are brilliant at this. They said country general manager approval after the event. Now, what that means is your expenses will disappear into the South Bank. They'll never be signed. If you complain about it, your name will appear on the wrong sorts of lists. You don't want to be on those lists at quarter end. So the practice emerged, I hasten to add this as friends of friends and acquaintances of mine, I would of course never do this, of overtipping London taxi drivers. But if you overtip a London taxi driver, you get a blank receipt. The blank receipt was then filled out for the price of the pizza and coke. The staff signed a form to say they had the per food. Yeah, and you took the bus and submitted the expense claim and everybody was happy. So I gave this as an example last year at the Scrum Alliance Conference of Berlin. This is 17 years later, by the way. Three people from IBM ran up to me afterwards and said, we're still doing that, did you invent it? <laughs> now, if you go into any large organization, you will see a huge amount of energy in what I call the shadow organization, making the formal system appear to be efficient. It's actually extremely inefficient. And what happens is that tension builds up. Sooner or later, it breaks catastrophically. Yeah? There's a huge amount of actual cost which can be taken out by removing process. It's not about motivating staff. It's actually about changing the structures in their work, something which Denin said years ago and everybody's forgotten. Yeah? It's a downward pressure of systems which actually impacts on people. They can sort out their personal motivation for themselves, guys. Just give them a chance. You just need to create the systems which support what they need to do. So order systems have value, but that's the danger. The second type of system is a chaotic system. Now, I should say there's no complete agreement on the terms here. Some people, you know, the field's fairly new, so don't get hung up on the language. If you think this is complex, well, you may be right in some fields. But in the fields I work, a chaotic system is a random system. There is no constraint. Yeah? That means it's only ever a temporary state. It's very difficult for things to stay unconnected. Yeah? So if you actually fall into it accidentally, it's a major crisis. Yeah? But it won't, the crisis never lasts for long. Somebody will put some type of constraint in place. So the reality is, if you want to use it deliberately, you actually have to create rigid boundaries. It's rather like nuclear fission. Yeah? The, the, the energy for the magnetic fields to contain the plasma is more than the energy you get out of it. But if you can create complete randomness, there's two major advantages. One is radical innovation. Yeah? because things can then be allowed to connect in completely novel ways in constrained circumstances. The other use is for distributed decision support. So about a year ago, I was, um, had two rather interesting engagements in Florida. Uh, one was with one, the board of one of the world's largest fashion houses, one of my favorite clients, because they stay in hotels that don't have stars, because you have to have stars. You really don't understand quality, right? Um, we actually had a really good managed senior management session in Morocco in the desert, and the Paris Ballet were commissioned to form a special ballet for the management group. I mean, I, I like this client, all right? <laughs> so I, I go through a really nice hotel in Miami, then I go on to a, a large um, geo-intelligence conference where I've got 2,000 intelligence agents from the CIA and God knows what else, and the bastards announced that Snowden was keynoting at their conference and didn't say which Snowden. <laughs> I hasten to add, I was added before my name, I was invited before my namesake came famous, but they took the opportunity, they put me on first. So I went on with a degree of prep trepidation, um, partly because I've just refused a teaching assignment in Texas because my students apparently would be allowed to do open carry next year. Uh, and I've been sent a handbook on not to provoke them. Well, I'm not known for not provoking students, and I don't intend to start differently. Right? Um, either way, so kind of like, I'm a bit nervous, but we go on. One thing we did there, we then presented a situation on Syria, this is a year ago. 
an informatic on that. We're actually about to start this on a huge project across British government departments. So we present an informatic. Everybody interprets the informatic in 30 seconds without consultation. And I'll talk about how we do that later. And then we actually show a landscape map from that which shows the dominant views and the minority views in real time. So within 60 seconds, we're actually presenting a senior decision maker with multiple perspectives in an ungameable way. And that's actually using chaos because we need everything to be separated from everything else for that work. If you've read the sort of um, wisdom of the crowds concept, it's sort of built, built on that. Yeah? Um, this is actually quite important. We're about to start a major project in Wales where actually school children will become a sensor network so we can ask questions in real time of the entire population. Yeah, and that's designed to replace focus groups, polling and everything else and provide a much faster feedback mechanism. So there's a lot we can do with this when we understand it. And then you get complex adaptive systems. Uh, complex adaptive systems... Um, we've only known about them for a few years. You, you can trace it back to Russian mathematicians if you really try it, but it probably goes back to Prigogine, um, originally in Bre Belgium and then in, in Austin. Um, Kaufman in um, biology, but Arthur in economics and other people. Complex adaptive systems are ones where any container constraint is permeable, or what we call a dark constraint. That's a reference to dark matter. You can see there's a constraint, but you don't know what's causing it. And that, that's very common in human systems. Things like taboo, for example, or culture provides a dark constraint. Yeah. Um, and actually, anything which is coupling, the coupling is, again, dark or loose or elastic or permeable or non-existent. So the thing is very fluid, and it's constantly changing. Yeah. If you want a metaphor for this, uh, imagine there are a group of magnets um, around a flat surface with a high coefficient of resistance. Uh, I get pedants sometimes, so you know, this is a metaphor. On the surface, there are cast iron hockey, you know, like hockey pucks. If all of the magnets keep the same polarity and strength, then the hockey pucks will maintain a stable relationship. If I change one of the magnets, I can predict the result. If I change two of the magnets, I can model the result. Three of the magnets, it's getting impossible. Yeah. Now, actually, those in complexity are called modulators. If you look at systems thinkers, they always talk about drivers. Because what they want is discover something that they can pull, which will produce a predetermined effect. Yet the reality is a complex adaptive system is modulated, it's not driven. It's essentially unforecastable. The key phrase on complexity is a complex system does not have linear causality. It has dispositionality and propensities. So a disposition is a probability statement about how it might change, but not a predictive statement. And the propensity, this goes back to Popper, is, a re is an aspect of the system which appears stable, but you don't know why. So it's rather like if you knew nothing about gambling and you went into a gambling den, and somebody you saw the roulette wheel kept coming up red, and you assumed it was always going to do that. Yeah, that's another danger with cases. So that's kind of like a complex adaptive system, and this is most human systems, and actually what now matters is a twofold thing. Yeah, what's the dispositional state? Will it actually allow me to make the changes I want? If it won't allow me to make the changes, then I first of all have to change the state. The massive difference between complexity thinkers and systems thinkers is we start with how things are and we try and nudge it in a direction. Systems thinking start with how they think it should be and try and yank people towards it. There's a difference between starting a journey and determining a goal. Yeah? And if you look at it, virtually every management method for the past 20 or 30 years has started with defining where things should be yeah, and then tried to fill the gaps. Complexity actually reverses that, uh, which is why we don't confuse it. Now, the best way I've ever learned to explain this um, is to give an example. Um, probably the best example of this is um, if you can imagine organizing a party for a bunch of um, seven or eight-year-old kids. Can everybody imagine running a party for a bunch of seven or eight-year-old kids? Okay, well, the basic principle of this is depending on what type of system you're in, you will manage things in a different way. Now, this is the radical idea, by the way. This is called multi-ontology sense-making. Up until the current time, everybody assumed there is one approach to management. What complexity says is, depending on which system it is, you do completely different things. So let's assume, and by the way, you also made the mistake of holding this party in your own house. This is a major mistake, right? Yeah, community centers you know, are much more useful because they have fire hoses, Fire hoses are very useful for cleaning up after the party and they're occasionally necessary for crowd control during the party itself. <laughs> Let's imagine how you would organize a party based on which type of system it is. 
So if you assume the system is chaotic, then it means the children are completely unconstrained, which means they'll probably discover drugs and alcohol and go on a personal experience of self-discovery. <laughs> Your house may burn down in the process, but all property is theft and it was socially constructed in the first place, so why are you worried about it? That's just a letter in that for some colleagues. I don't recommend this. I've got one friend in California who tried it once, but he's never going to do it again. The recovery cost is very high. The order systems approach, on the other hand, you'd be very familiar with. Under this, you agree learning objectives for the party in advance of the party itself. The learning objectives should be aligned with the mission statement for education in the community to which you belong and should be clearly articulated and printed off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys and water dropping into ponds and placed around the room where you hold the party. Yeah. Um, as the children come into the party, they should be given Disney cards with the party value statement clearly printed on the back. And as they leave the party, they should see five buttons so they can press smiley faces to see how they felt at the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> You then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against the ideal party outcome. And the senior adult should start the party with a motivational DVD. You don't want the children you know, wasting time in play, which isn't aligned with the learning objectives. And then they should use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the party objectives <laughs> and show the children how their pocket money and allowances are linked to the milestone targets. Following the highly successful completion of the party, you conduct an after-action review, update your best practice database on party management, and mandate future process improvements. If for any remote reason the children aren't happy, then you hire appreciative inquiry practitioners who will get them to tell happy, clappy stories so they have happy mental models and suitably indoctrinated or like whatever you put in front of them next time. Everybody reasonably familiar with this approach to party management? <laughs> The complex systems approach, on the other hand, is much simpler. We start off by drawing a line in the sand, known as a boundary in complexity theory, and we look the children squarely in the eye, and we say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. <laughs> and one of the things you learn fast as an adult is the value of flexible, negotiable boundaries, because rigid boundaries have a habit of becoming brittle and breaking catastrophically. We then introduce catalytic probes, a football, a videotape, a barber, a computer game, and I hope a pattern of play will form. If it's beneficial, it's a dispositional state, we give it more energy or we don't take energy away. If it's a negative pattern, well, that's when you deploy the fire hoses. <laughs> so what we actually do is we manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries, and that's a key phrase. There are only three things you can manage in a complex system the boundary state, the catalysts, and the energy amplification. This is why it's actually becoming a major issue in government, because it also allows locally contextual solutions to emerge. You're managing an ecosystem, not engineering a manufacturing plant. And the engineering metaphor has underpinned everything for the past 20 or 30 years, from business process re-engineering to learning organization and Peter Senge. All of them are taking an engineering approach. So different types of system work in radically different ways. And the one thing I can say for certain about a complex adaptive system, the only thing I can say with absolute certainty, is whatever I do will have unintended consequences. Now, the picture is a crane toad introduced into Australia. Yeah? And I could give you many other examples. This actually has major ethical issues. Yeah? Because the one thing we know is if you do an intervention in a complex system, there will be unintended consequences. You are therefore ethically responsible for them even though you couldn't have predicted the particular consequence. And that actually means you now do small, parallel, safe-to-fail interventions, not one massive fail-safe. So the whole strategy changes. If it's complex, you have to do parallel probes to see what the system will do, and then respond accordingly. It's no coincidence the model I created this, the Kinevian framework, is actually taught on all command courses for the US Army now, at, at lieutenant colonel level because actually it's the ability to understand the system and know when you follow standard operating procedures and when you probe and don't follow standard operating procedures, which is key. Yeah? Different types of system, different types of approach. And I say there are a whole variety of consequences for that, but basically just to quickly go through the differences with system thinking. First one, I mentioned this already. This is a research project I'm currently working on. Um, because actually, if we got rid of the concept of money, there's no reason why we shouldn't provide free at the point of entry health care and education in any society in the world. It's just that we choose to ration it with money. 
If you look at indigenous communities, they don't have any token of exchange. They know whether you're in or out of the community. So we're look, doing some work at the moment. Can we measure gifting, because that's what it's called, because actually that gives us a different measurement of value. Uh, things like Bitcoin and those sort of things don't actually do that because they just substitute something else for money. And as with money, sooner or later, somebody will actually trade the commodity. Either the means of exchange will become a commodity, as we're already seeing happening. That's dangerous. So gifting is a, a big issue in a complex system. Um, second one, high levels of instrumentalization. What you see, and this is my big argument with um, David Halpern at the Nudge Unit, right? They decide where people should be and try and manipulate them to get them there. Yeah? Um, and that's a major issue. Uh, we say, where are people? And actually, what we also do with the new stuff we're doing on citizen engagement, called Engage, Empower, and Act, is to allow them to come up with their own interventions to actually achieve their own direction of travel rather than have the interventions designed by some instrumental authority. Yeah? You can see that with a whole bunch of stuff. And a lot of this comes out of the sort of neoliberalism of Tony Blair, who adopted <coughs> systems thinking en masse. You get the happiness there, you get all those sort of things which come out of it. Right? It's an instrumental approach based on what we think people should be, rather than starting from where they are. Um, another big one. This is actually a major problem in design thinking. Um, if you want to be a good designer, you've got to do a four or five year apprenticeship. You can't reduce it to a simple two day workshop yeah, and calling, saying you do ethnography when you go and interview five, six people, well, that indicates the paucity of thinking. Right? People are taking design and they're trying to make it into an, art, an artisan capability into a manufacturing process. And we've seen it with too many other things. Um, it takes four or five years for the brain and the body to co-evolve to the point where they have certain skills. Yeah? You can't just imprint people like you can imprint a computer with a single training course. And this actually attempt to reduce the concept of the artisan um, is a major issue at the moment in design and everywhere else. Yeah? Um, next one, social atomism. Uh, this is the concept that the primary unit of analysis is the individual and nothing else. You see this a lot in mental health, doing a big project at the moment on meaning in mental health. Basically, if you have a society which assumes everything is about the individual, which is a Northern European, North American characteristic, then the individual is held to be responsible for their condition. Yeah? Actually, whatever they do is a failure of that individual to achieve stuff. Um, if you actually look in Africa, Asia, Southern Europe, the Celtic fringe of Europe, you will find what's called commutarianism, the belief that actually people are defined by the community in which they grow up. Yeah? It's not that the community is defined by them. And actually, the, the, the science is now backing up that concept. What social atomism has done is just to fragment us into isolated individuals looking after ourselves. Yeah? And that's my objection to the focus on individual qualities. It's not about how individual people feel. It's about the social communities and the interactions they have. That's the kind of like important thing. Yeah? So again, we're starting to resurrect some of that material. We're not cogs in some giant machine. Drivers, not modulators, I've already mentioned. Girls, you journeys, I've mentioned. Um, and then it's also issue about targets. So let's give you two quotes. This is Goodhart's Law. Uh, advisor to the Bank of England, major economist. As soon as the government attempts to regulate any particular set of financial assets, these become unreliable indicators of economic trends. Yeah. Famous law, and it's not just good art. Other people thought of it before. Uh, Marilyn Strathen, who's one of the great British anthropologists, translated that. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And we can see this in academic life. People are measured on published papers. So now all that matters is to publish four or five papers a year in a limited number of journals. And therefore, you write what the journal editors will accept. You don't, have, you don't introduce novelty because the measure has become a target. Yeah? And the whole concept of outcome-based measurement and setting targets, this is my I don't have a problem with actually people being happy. I have a major problem with what will then happen because companies will set targets for happiness and then we'll get the problem. Yeah, and that's a behavioral characteristic that you can't stop in the current climate. Um, the other variation on this is for new scientists. Um, basically, wherever people are working for extrinsic, you know, for extrinsic tangible rewards, yeah, basically it destroys intrinsic motivation. What do we do with nurses and teachers? We actually force them to work for explicit goals, which destroys the intrinsic motivation. We're actually now finding that the only way that nurses can actually provide care is to break the rules. In order to be empathetic, you've got to break the rules. In order to provide customer care, you've got to break the rules. 
because actually we fail to understand that a complex system can't be defined by outcomes or outputs. It can only be defined by what we call vector measures, direction and speed of travel for intensity of effort from the present. And interestingly, if you don't know, 45% of welfare budgets go on monitoring the activity rather than the activity itself. And there are 517 targets in the average British hospital with 20% of the budget going on managing the measurement system rather than providing health. Yeah, so we've created a system which is pervert beyond belief, which is actually dehumanizing people because we've got this obsession with telling people what they should be and what they should achieve rather than allowing them to develop in a, in a collegiate environment. And anything which does that, I think, is dangerous. So, kind of like some of the things we can do about this, and this is kind of conclusion. Uh, this is from Peter Drucker. Um, most important thing in communication is to hear what isn't being said. It's the unarticulated needs which count. Now, that leads me into something else you need to be aware of. If you don't know it, painting comes before language in human evolution. It's one of those accidents of evolution which turns out to have advantage. So if you look at ape languages or Cretaceous languages, they name things. So there's a Dunbar's number limit on their vocabulary. Whereas we started off by abstractions, and then our language evolved from that. So whatever we write down is a temporary concrete representation of a more abstract concept, which has major implications for data analytics, by the way. Yet what you can write down is 5% of what you know. Therefore, what can be rendered on a screen is maybe 5 or 10%. And that's one of the problems we've got. We've become an information-centric rather than a knowledge-centric society. And actually, we're now becoming a data-centric, not an information-centric, and that's actually very dangerous. Yeah? So basically, that abstraction is key um, because what abstraction allows us to do is to make novel connections. So the approach we did, and this is kind of like an alternative, you've all done an employee satisfaction survey? Uh, we got them all the time in IBM, and I remember you know, one came in, does your manager consult you on a regular basis, zero, not at all, ten all the time? You know what answer they want. Yeah? It's evaluative, and if you evaluate something, it triggers your brain in a different way than if you describe something. You're nervous about how it will be received. Yeah? So I phoned up HR, I got straight through to the worldwide vice president. I think it was something to do with the fact I'd run a six-month experimental program which had proved that astrology was more reliable than Myers-Briggs in actually predicting team behavior. <laughs> and I'd realized if they didn't understand irony, they wouldn't understand irony, re ironic research, and they wanted to fire me for it, but Lou pointed out that they were welcome to try, and did they really want to go to court on it, all right? So that was one. Either way, I, got, I said, well, how am I meant to answer this? I've got several managers, not to mention the people I take business direction from. Sometimes they consult me, sometimes they don't, sometimes they should, sometimes they shouldn't. And she said, average your experience over the last year in top banking trouble. And then I said, and you'll think you're HR in the research community? Now, we take a different approach. We ask people what's called a non-hypothesis question. And this is normally done not as a special event, but inter integrated into a workbook, part of a day-to-day -day activity, not a special survey or a special system. It's integrated into the day-to-day -day activity. And then we'll say, you know, take a picture of, what, why it's good to, of why you, why, what it's like to work here. What story would you tell your best friend if they were off the job in your work group? That's called a non-hypothesis question. Then we ask them to interpret the story onto a series of triangles. Now, these are high abstraction. They're also designed to create cognitive load. So this is one example. Uh, in this one, we're asking about decisions. The prompting question here is, give an example of a decision made recently which affected you personally, which summarizes the culture of this organization. Yeah? And that's actually a non-hypothesis question, and it gives us decision maps as well. And we said, in the decision, did the executive make the decision based on logical analysis, intuitive action, or based on principles? So three positive qualities balanced. Yeah? Interesting, we've just done a big survey for Pricewaterhouse Data Analytics. This is a data analytics group. Last year, they did linear scales on three qualities of entrepreneurship. Yeah, strategic execution, capability, market disruption. When they put them up as three Likard scales, everybody scored them high. When we put them as a triangle, market disruption more or less disappeared. Yeah? Uh, what you're doing is you're increasing the cognitive load to go into what's called autonomic or thinking slow, if you want the more popular term, because you don't want people thinking fast. The minute you make an explicit survey, people move into automatic pilot. You want to go deeper. And typically, people will move around between four or six triangles. So that's called high abstraction metadata a method we developed and patented when working for the 
um, security services. It's been used extensively in a lot of projects, dominates within the development sector. This is from um, Girl Hub, working in Africa, where we're understanding sexual abuse of young kids. And young kids are now becoming ethnographers to their own communities. In Pakistan, we sent children out to interview their grandparents, their parents, and their own generation. And actually, critically, and this is the power issue, they interpret the data. It's not interpreted by a computer or by an expert, which means it's a quant method in a traditionally called domain. Yeah? So that's kind of like the generic approach. We're using that now for user requirements capture. So what we do is we go to a body of users, we get them to every time they get frustrated with the system, every time they see something that they'd like, every time something happens, they just grab it, record it, screenshot, bit of writing, voice, whatever, they interpret it. Yeah? When we then see statistically valid cluster patterns in those fragments, we put a pair programming team onto it to develop a prototype to see if we can improve it. Because, of course, users don't know what to ask for. Yeah? So what we're actually doing is we're dealing with unarticulated needs, but using a statistical approach to present it right, in terms of the way it works. And the idea is to get it as pre principle called disintermediation. You actually don't want people interpreting their own data. So that allows us to do some quite sophisticated things. And I'll kind of like finish off with these. This is from work we've been doing with one of the US's big manufacturers. Here we're actually we're measuring attitudes to safety. Because attitudes are a lead indicator, compliance is a lag indicator. So basically what we're doing here is engineers, we've actually moved and their workbooks now contain a few triangles. So if you see something which is a bit unusual, not enough to report, flag it, interpret it. So we're not running a survey or having boards. It's kind of like just part of their day-to-day -day routine, which is what you need to do if you want to understand people. Yeah? So basically, we do that. So this is actually, I think there's about two or 300,000 observations in the system. Uh, the left-hand one on these is civilian. The right-hand one is military. The vertical dimension is rule compliance. The horizontal dimension is job completion. Uh, you now see another key principle of sense making. You should be able to see what it means instantly. So you can see in civilian, you either get the job done or you follow the rules. The two are mutually incompatible states. All of the surveys, all of the focus groups, all of the expert consultation says they're doing both because they know that's what legally they're meant to do. So you can't trust the result. Yeah? Military looks more attractive when you see that top right-hand cluster until you check the context and discover it's nuclear weapons testing, which kind of makes the case the context in which rule compliance and job completion becomes a survival matter not just for you, but to everybody around you. Yeah? So it's not a replicable context. We've then got the get the job done, ignore the rules, and we've got this really scary one down here, I've given up. Now, just to depress you, that's a pattern we are seeing in British hospitals. In a real crisis, they're brilliant. On a day-to-day -day basis, the good people break the rules. Most people are just doing what they need to do to survive. Yeah? And that's really very scary. Now, what we can now do is an intervention here and this is where it gets very interesting, is what it allows us to do is that's the board level representation. Now, the summary I'm going to give you now is a whole new theory of change. I then click, for example, you can see here where the blue arrows are pointing. This in complexity is called an adjacent possible. I then click on that and say, and look at the original observations. There's no interpretation here. I'm going directly to the raw data. That's called disintermediation. And I say, as a board, what can we do to create more observations like this and fewer observations like that? I don't try and move to the top right. It's too far away. And this is nudging existing dispositional states. But that's what the board have got. Each factory have got their own framework. This is called fractal management. But actually now, for each factory, the situation is contextually different, but it comes from the same source data. So you can have everybody doing things in their local context, appropriate to the local context, but they fractally aggregate to create a general direction. And this is how we now set targets. Yeah, you need to get this disposition rate shifting in this direction over this period, which gives you corrective time and action in terms of the way it works. So it's not that we can't do things, but there are radical new ways of going about it. And of course, all of this requires us to manage. So a final point, this is actually, if you know the origin of the word manage in English, it comes from the Italian word, which I can never pronounce, menagere, which actually means the ability to ride a horse in dressage. Now, what actually happens is that's what it means in Italy. It then gets corrupted by the French. Many things have been corrupted by the French. 
not as many as have been corrupted by the English, but close, right? um, to mean household management. That's Mrs. Beaton's book. Yeah? Uh, if you're managing an ordered system, you can manage it like a recipe book. If you're managing a complex system, it's like riding a horse. It's a very different process, but you still manage. Don't ever get rid of that need. Right? But the key thing I've been trying to get across here is we need a scientific base to understand human systems. We need to understand that you take different approaches in different contexts, and we need to create real-time feedback loops. Because if we haven't got a real-time feedback loop, by the time we see what we need to see, it's far too late to do anything about it. Thank you very much for your time.